chapter 14 this morning, please, verse 26. I'm going to preach you a message entitled, The Controversial Christ. Amen. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Man, that's right down the line. Heard anybody talk like that lately? No. Father, bless your word, and I pray for unction and anointing. And Father, I pray it received, be received by the hearts of the people. They'll have ears to hear and a heart that can believe. In thy holy name, amen. You can be seated. This, of course, is a reference to discipleship. In plain words, if you're going to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to have to be completely sold out. That's the bottom line. A disciple is a learner, a follower. This is not an apostle. A disciple, I'm a disciple. You're a disciple. Uh, churches today, some of them call themselves the disciples of Christ. A disciple is a learner. Who's my teacher? The Holy Ghost, the Lord Jesus Christ. So a, what he said about discipleship is a very controversial statement. Because it means that in order to be a disciple of the Lord, that you need to be completely dedicated unto him. As the world says, that you need to be one of those devout Christians. Folks, that's garbage. Devout, where do you get that from the Bible? You either are a Christian or you're not a Christian. Amen. But because of what he said, he has become very controversial. Listen to what he said in John chapter number 6 and verse 48. He said, I am the bread of life. Then in John 8, verse 12, it then spake Jesus unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. The I am's in John, the Greek word is ego imi. It is an imperative. It is a statement of how great and wonderful it is, a powerful thing. Said, I am the good shepherd. He said in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Then in John chapter 14, verse 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, uh, rather, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, my dear friend, that eliminates an awful lot of people. You say, well, doesn't, he, uh, doesn't his religion uh, kind of uh, just coalesce with the rest of them and join in? And we can just all be one happy religious family? I mean, I, I, the, the, you know, the, the people of faith, you hear all of that, you hear about it all the time. My dear friend, your faith can be in the wrong thing. The Lord Jesus Christ is our faith. He is everything or He's nothing. It's that simple. Now this generation today, they don't like that. They're used to they're used to a kind of a a kind of a baby food Jesus I guess would be a good way to put it a pablum Jesus uh, where you can you don't need any teeth you don't need any you don't really need a much of ability to digest just a spoon fed feel good messages and that's what you hear today and you never really hear anything from the pulpit today that compares our Lord Jesus Christ with the rest of these religions out here. And that's a sad thing because in some of these churches you go into them and you leave and you feel good. But you've never heard the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way. There is no other way. In the book of John chapter 15, he said, I'm the true vine. What is the true vine? The true vine is compared to the vine of poison. He said, their grapes are the grapes of wrath. They're the grapes that set the children's teeth on edge. There's a difference between the grape, John 15, that yields the good fruit, that yields the joy of God, and all of this mishmash stuff that you hear today. So in John chapter number 15, he said, I'm the true vine. And my friend, he said it over there in the book of Isaiah chapter number 11, I think, or 10. He said, I planted you a noble vine. He said, what happened to you? I planted you a noble vine to bring forth fruit. What happened to you? Our purpose in being here today is to not enjoy big buildings. It's not to enjoy uh, air conditioning. Our purpose in being here today is to manifest, glorify, and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You can do that in a building of brick and stone, and you can also do it in a brush harbor. 
and a tent scattered somewhere out in the back of someone's house to glorify the Son of God. In John chapter number 8 and verse 58, Jesus said to them, Verily I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. And emphasize, I am. Re emphasize, ego, I am. Ego in Greek is where we get our English, ego. And you all know what that means. It's taken straight. It's transliterated. That's what that is. Ego, I am. I am that I am. It's that attitude with emphasis placed upon it. So the Lord Jesus Christ said before Abraham was, I am. That reminds me of, he, of the book of uh, Exodus chapter number 3. When Moses said, now when I go to the children of Israel and they ask me, who sent you? In other words, what is your authority to come to us? And to project yourself as a leader of the children of Israel. He said, the Lord said, Moses, you tell them that I am hath sent you. Amen. That Hebrew word translated I am is haya. It is haya, haya. And you get a lexicon and try to look up the meaning to that word. You ought to do it for your own edification. And you'll find that it's mystical. You'll find that it's mysterious. You'll find that that word has a meaning of glory. It has a meaning of substance. It means that I am the self-existing one. I exist because I exist. Amen. I tell you, that's got to be something to get a hold of the soul. The God that I worship today exists because He exists. I exist because He exists. But that word also has a bearing on eternity. It means that there is no beginning and there is no end to this self-existing one. So when you go to the children of Israel, use those terms. They know the Hebrew, Haya, Haya, and hath sent me. The Al Shaddai that he sang about a moment ago. That Almighty God. That God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. The God that was there when you went into Egypt. He's the God that will lead you out of Egypt. He's the God that will never fail you. He is God. And beside Him there is none other. Hallelujah to God. I don't preach a dead God and I don't preach a man-made God. I don't preach a fathom of my mind, something created in some laboratory. I preach that eternal, almighty, self-existing one. And that, my friend, is a very controversial statement. Then you say, preacher, are you telling me that the God of the Jew is the only God there is? Yes. That's exactly what I'm telling you. I'm telling you that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, or Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, whichever you want to say it, He's the only true and living God. And then he is controversial about who he condemned. In John chapter number 8 and verse 44, Ye are of your father the devil. Who said that? And the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar. And the father of it. In other words, the first lie originated in the heart of Satan. That anointed cherub that covereth. High, exalted, and lifted up. Cherubim have a very special place near the holiness of God. That meant that at one time, according to Ezekiel chapter number 28, he led the choir of heaven, that he had an exalted position. That meant that Satan was where the angels were not even allowed to go. And he was leading the glory. He was leading the worship of God. And he said, you're your father, the devil. Isaiah 14 tells us what happened to him. He said, he thought in his heart, I will, I will, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit in the congregation, the sides of the north. I will that my will is above Almighty's God. God, and that's what will mess you up today. Your will, your volition, your choices that you make. This is why you're so different. You can choose, unlike an animal. Had a doctor tell me a couple of days ago, he's working on my teeth. You know, a dentist. And some of you get on edge when you go in there, and I'm about the same way. This dentist looked at me and he said, you know what? We were talking about things. He said, did you know that an elephant can look into a mirror and it has a concept of its existence? In plain words, that elephant looks into that mirror and knows that mirror is a reflection of the elephant. That's pretty smart. That's what the dentist told me. He said, but if a dog looks into a mirror, it jumps. Or a cat looks into a mirror. Ah! 
Why? Because it thinks it's another animal. It has no concept of self-existence. It has no concept of where it is in life. You see what I'm saying? And this is what the issue is all about. It has no concept. We are men. We are eternal. We either spend eternity in heaven or eternity away from God in hell. God made us with a consciousness, a sense about us. No animal has that. We love Him today and no other th- creature can love Him. And I love Him because I love Him. And I love Him because He loved me first. And He's the Lord. And beside Him there is none other. I don't know how much time I've got left in this world. I've got my settled in my heart. I settle this. I settle this. Now if I go here and I go there, you know, I'm, I'm careful about where I go. I don't make a fool of myself. But I settled it with God. I'm going to church. If I drop dead right here in this place, it's going to come here. This is important to me. The house of God. I'll die right here. And that's for me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Hallelujah to God. You feel better when you do that. Amen. If God wants to take me from here, I'm ready to go. That's the way it ought to be. I have a sense, folks, of where I came from, where I'm going, who I am, what this is all about. You understand what I'm saying? We're human beings. We're not animals. And we understand there's a God in heaven. And that's what's important for all of us today. So he is, uh, he's controversial for who he condemned. The Jews have the oral law. They say it's a law given to Moses at Sinai. They say the oral law trumps the written law. The oral law has produced what we know today as the Talmud. And it also has produced today what we know as the Kabbalah or Kabbalah. And my friend, both of these things, the Kabbalah and the Talmud, lead away from God. If you could get that junk out of the hands of a Jew and just leave him with the Bible like a Kairite Jew. A Kairite Jew rejects rabbinic Judaism. They reject the, they, they reject the Talmud. They reject Kabbalah. And all they have is their Bible. Well, let me tell you something. They got everything. They got the Bible. Amen. Give him the Bible and then start dealing with him out of the Bible. See, who is that in Isaiah chapter 53? Who's he talking about? Who is that in Isaiah chapter number 41, the servant of the Lord? Who is this? And without the Talmud and the Kabbalah, then you have to make him deal with the word of God. And that's a different thing. The Lord said you've made his word of none effect by your traditions of men. The Lord Jesus Christ is controversial because of what they said about him. In the book of John chapter 7 verse 46, the officers answered, Never a man spake like this man. <laughs> and I'm sure some of those sages thought to themselves, now, Hold on a minute, haven't you ever heard me teach? I mean, good night, what are you talking about? Well, I'm a master in Israel. Nicodemus, you know all about it. I'm a smart man. Just listen to me for a while. You'll see how much I know. And these people said, Never a man spake like this man. He doesn't speak like the scribes and Pharisees. When he speaks, it's with authority. That's what we need today. We don't need groveling crawfish. Afraid to say God's word. Making excuses for what God said. Folks, I'm here because he's there. You understand what I'm saying? I live because he lives. Why shouldn't I praise him today? Give him glory for everything. I owe God all that I am. My goodness, man. Never a man spake like this man. They listened to him. He spoke to their heart. And that's the way God always speaks. God does not tickle your intellect. He's not interested in impressing you with anything. Nicodemus came to him and said, We know there are a teacher come from God. No man can do the things I do except God be with him. You need to be born again. <laughs> no conversation, Nicodemus. Come to the point. He, he is controversial because of what they said about him. John 4, 29, a woman at the well, come see a man, told me all things ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, who's she saying this to? Who are the people? You remember the context? Who are these people she's talking to? They're Samaritans. They're Samaritans. A Samaritan woman. He said to his disciples, I must needs go through Samaria. And then he went in at noon, the hottest time of the day when the rest of the women were away. 
The woman came to the well, had five husbands. Man she was with then wasn't her husband. But the Lord Jesus Christ went way out of his way. There's a road called the Jordan Rift. And when you go from the north in Galilee to the south, you normally go down that Jordan Rift. In other words, the Jordan River cuts in the, into the land. But instead, he went over into Samaria, well, way out of his way. So he could see one bleeding soul. One sheep. And oh, what a day she had. I'll bet she never imagined when she got up that morning that she's going to have a conversation with the Messiah. I perceive thou art a prophet, she said. He's a prophet. Amen. He's a prophet. Moses called him a prophet. But there was never a prophet like this prophet. Amen. So, he is controversial because of what they said about him. But he's also controversial because of what he did. In the book of Mark chapter 3, And they watched him, and whether he would heal them on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. See, there's a motive. The Holy Spirit gives you the motive behind it. They weren't interested in truth. They were interested in finding fault in him. Some of you come to church, and you sit back there, and you say to yourself, Well, I don't know if any of this is anything. It's just a bunch of junk. Just a bunch of, just a bunch of emotional people in here. Oh, yes. Have you ever read the Bible? No, I mean, have you ever read it? Well, the Bible says that uh, give a little wine to the stomach's sake. And all. Have you ever read the Bible? Most of them have never read the Bible. Now, read it. And ask God to open your heart and show you His Word. And you might be surprised. Heal on the Sabbath day. Mark chapter number 2 verse 7. Why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God? Only God. <laughs> it demands an answer. He's God! <laughs> yes. It demands an answer. It's a rhetorical question. Who can forgive sins but God? You're right, folks. Only God can forgive sins. Well, he forgave them others. So that means he's God. That's what that means. Mark chapter 11. And they come to Jerusalem. And Jesus went to the temple and began to cast them out. And sold and bought in the temple. And overthrew the tables of the money changers. And the seats of them that sold doves. He's cleansing the temple. I imagine how they felt after that. Good night, man. He comes in and he cleanses their temple. Who is this guy? Well, I mean, who, the, who does he think he is? He's out here healing on the Sabbath. He's out here forgiving sins. And now he's cleansing the temple. Why, my goodness. That's enough to get any man stoned, right? Notice what it says here. That he went into the temple and began to cast them out. So what's that mean? Well, he didn't tell them to leave. <laughs> out! <laughs> get out of my house! <laughs> and then the next thing he did, and overthrew the tables of the money changers. You got all this money piled up here. <clears throat> money went flying right and left. Can you imagine how though they run, jumped in there and piled on top of that money? Third thing he did, look what it says in your Bible. This is remarkable. And the seats of them that sold doves. He didn't touch the dove. He didn't touch it. It's a clean animal. It's a type of the Holy Ghost. But the seats, out the door. And of course, when they had nowhere to sit, out they went. They went with the doves. Matthew 12. He cast out devils. Pharisees heard it. They said the fellow doth not cast out devils. But by Beelzebub. The prince of the devils. And on it goes. This is just a sampling. Of all the things that he did. That brought hatred and animus down against him. They despised him. Oh when he was hanging on the cross. They said. Found it. Heal us. Come down from that tree. If thou be the Son of God, mocked him, cast in his face, spit on him, beat him. And he took it. He took it because of who he was. You see, he's controversial because of who he is. John chapter 18, as soon as they'd said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Judas Iscariot leads them to Gethsemane. So how do you know he's going to find him? He knew where he prayed. He knew where to find him. Too bad Judas had never prayed there. 
but he knew where he prayed. Carried them in there. There they were. And he said, don't bother the disciples. I'm the one you're looking for. I am. The word he, look in your Bible, is italicized. Why is it italicized? Because the King James translator simply put it in there for continuity. He literally said, I am. And that's all it took. You're not going to stand in the presence of I am. You ain't going to do it. No human being will ever stand in the presence of I am except he be lifted up by the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, accepted in the beloved. You'll never approach I am without it be the Lord Jesus Christ taking you into the presence of the Father. You can't live where I am is except you live by the life and the faith of the Son of God who gave himself for us. You can't stand before I am in your own righteousness. It has to be the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ and everything else there is. What are you trying to say to me, preacher? I'm telling you this. I'm going to take hold of him. And I ain't turning loose of him. And I'm telling you right now, he's going to take us to the Father. And the only way you'll ever get to the Father is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you get there, I can't tell you this morning what you're going to see. But I can read the Bible for you. Hebrews chapter number 1, verse 4. Be made so much better than the angels. He hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now here's a comparison of the Lord Jesus with angels. The apostle that writes Hebrews is comparing the Lord Jesus with angels. For to which of the angels said he at any time thou art my son? This day have I begotten thee and again. I will be to him a father and he shall be to me a son. Not so with any angel. Nor cherubim nor seraphim. Verse 6, and again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, now watch this, let all the angels of God worship him. Nowhere in the Bible is it written that that voice speaks, but the apostle that wrote this says that when Christ came and he was in that virgin's womb and then he was born in Bethlehem of Judea, these angels of God were instructed by the Holy Ghost, worship that little baby right there. And then here's what follows. And of the angels, he saith, he maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he saith. Now, this is important. This is something. I mean, if this is not true, it's pure blasphemy. If he's not who he said he was, this is raw blasphemy. Look at it. But unto the Son, he saith. Who's he? Go back and read the context. God the Father. God the Father speaking. Unto the Son, God the Father says, Thy throne, O God. He never called anything anywhere at any time, God, but His Son. Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of Thy kingdom. That's strong stuff. The Lord Jesus Christ is called God by God the Father. Notice carefully, the Lord Jesus has his own throne. And that's a great study in itself is to find out these thrones. How, the, how does these thrones work through the Bible? What's going on with thrones? The Bible said right now, seated at the right hand of the Father, the throne of God in high, the Lord Jesus on the throne of grace. One day I'll come back. Take the kingdoms of this world. And as we talked about from the book of Ezekiel and Daniel this morning, he's going to sit down on the throne of David. And he'll take the Davidic kingdom. And he'll reign over the house of Israel and over the earth for a thousand glorious years. I don't know if you can enthrone him in your heart. You can believe in your heart. It's a work of grace. You understand? You, you receive things that you can't really do anything about or with, but he does it. If you receive the truth, the Holy Ghost will take that truth that you receive and he'll work a work of grace in you. And that's how you get saved. That's how you get saved. But I'll tell you this. I saw the Lord, Isaiah said, high and lifted up. The only thing we'll ever know about God is the Son until we see the Father. And the only way you'll ever see the Father is through the Son. He's going to come. And when he comes, he comes in power and great glory. Controversial preacher. You mean to tell me that Jesus Christ is God? Yes, I do. 
You notice he didn't say, thy throne, a God. He said, thy throne, O God. Well, this God speaking to God, we've got more than one God. No, we have the Godhead. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The Godhead. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the Godhead manifest in flesh. Holy Ghost is the Godhead working in the Spirit. And God the Father is seated, at the, is seated on His throne. His throne that's unapproachable. His throne in heaven. Now, praise God. Do you have Him in your heart? I'm not talking about in your head. You may believe all the right things about Christ in your head. That's all good. You believe everything the Bible says about him, you believe it in your head, that's good. That's the first start. But you've got to get it in your heart. From the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth confessions made in self. Well, how do I know then, preacher? Because you come to him as a sinner condemned without hope and without God. In plainer words, you come to God on a spiritual platform, in a spiritual sense, a, a, sp a sense of need. You see, that goes way beyond the intellect. It gets into the spirit. And you come to him and you say, Lord Jesus, for the first time in my life, I see what a dirty, low-down, stinking dog I am. I'm guilty like the woman at the well of everything you ever said. I'm, I, I, I'm lost. I have no hope. And I need to be saved. You come to him like that. And you'll walk out of this house today a new creature in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. Father, your holy name, I thank you for your word. Thank you for the folks listening. Lord, they've listened very good today. Holy Ghost been in the house, and I've done what I'm called to do. I have peace. I can rest now. But Lord, I'm finished. Now it's the work of God. Now it's the work of the Holy Ghost. Go out, Lord, and do whatever you want to do here in this house. And people watching this thing over the Internet right now, watch it later, make a difference. Do what you want to do. Save souls. Reclaim the backslidden. Bring them back into the fold. And those, Heavenly Father, that are out there and feeding the swine, feeding the swine, wake them up. Wake them up. May they come to themselves and come back. In Jesus' name, amen.